Formula One cars are complicated. Every tiny detail is there for a reason. Everything is thoroughly considered by hundreds of engineers. So there must be a reason why each wheel of a Formula One car is pointing in a slightly different direction. So to find out why F1 teams set up their cars in this way, we're going to chat to Brake, Max Verstappen's ex-performance engineer, as well as go over what these things feel like as a driver. The contact patch of a Pirelli tire is pretty similar to the area of your palm, but somehow they allow these cars to pull over 5G through braking zones and some corners. And that's absolutely insane levels of grip. But these tyres have to be picky. You have to have the car set up to get these tyres working at their best. And one of the simplest adjustments F1 teams make is with tyre pressures. And this is a balancing act. Tyre pressures can affect grip levels, tyre wear, tyre warm up and the stiffness of the tyre. All sorts. How does an F1 engineer actually approach this? This is Blake Hinsey who's worked as a performance engineer for Max Verstappen and Sergio Perez, and now has his own YouTube channel, Break F1. So over to Blake to explain. So regarding tire pressures, in general, you tend to want to run them as low as possible to an extent. The idea is you're trying to maximize the contact patch with the ground. If you go too low, you have buckling or the tires folding over on themselves. So you actually, despite having lower pressure, have less contact with the ground. So that's that's really the main aim is to get the most grip out of the tire. There's the second thing to consider is your tire wear pattern. If you have too much or too little pressure, you could wear out the center of the tire versus the shoulder of the tires. So that's a consideration. But in Formula One, you don't really have so many things to play with there because Pirelli prescribed the minimum tire pressures and they're relatively high. So most teams tend to run minimum pressures all the time uh, on track. The tires will be 25 PSI front. 23 PSI rear or even higher. Now, the next parameter in our list is ride height, how high you set your suspension. And you're probably thinking, set it up as low as possible. And you'd be right. As a driver, a car that is too high and wallowy will be unpredictable and unresponsive. But you also don't want to be smashing over the bumps or bottoming out your car too much, because if you bottom out over a bump, you effectively have zero grip. But the second thing is that you'll set your front and rear ride height separately with a balance between the two. As a driver, I personally like a hint of oversteer in a car. So if I were driving a non-aero car, I would run with the nose a little bit lower than the rear, putting more weight and therefore grip over those front tires. But in Formula One, aero is everything. So the engineers will actually change ride heights based on aerodynamic balance. And so ride height is really important to an F1 car. Ride heights are probably one of the most fundamental parameters in a Formula One car setup. Yes, there's loads of parameters, but in Formula One, aero is king and the ride heights dictate how those surfaces interact with the air and the ground. If we talk about ranges, your front setup, you might use between zero and 30 millimeters of range on the front. And on the rear, you might go down as low as zero on bumps, etc. But the static ride height might be, you know, something like 80 millimeters to start. And listen to that. 30 millimeters at the front and as low as zero at the rear. That's all down to these new ground effect cars. It's because they accelerate the air between the car's floor and the ground to create an area of low pressure, downforce. And the lower the floor, the greater that effect. But there is a rule stopping the teams running the cars at zero ride height and you might have heard of it, plank wear. Too much wear at the end of the Grand Prix and you're disqualified. Just think back to Charles and Lewis at Cota. One of the reasons you may be changing ride height is you've realized you don't have as much plank wear as you thought. For example, you might notice that you haven't been wearing the front skid and you can lower the front ride height a little bit. That is basically free downforce. Typically, rear ride height adjustments on a car are either uh, telescoping threaded rods or shims. So those are almost always in session changes like ride heights, anti-roll bars and springs are something that teams are changing often and they will make those changes as easy as possible so that you can do them in a session. Now, one mad thing that F1 teams can do is set up their car to be asymmetrical. So asymmetrical car setup is normally only for oval cars, NASCAR, IndyCar, and so on. But on the rare occasion, F1 teams also do the same. Typically when you're setting up the ride heights, you'll assume like left to right, everything would be completely flat. But in some instances, there are cases that you might set up the car into a rolled or tilted state. And I've seen this a couple of times, not too often has it been successful, but the idea being that the car will generate the most downforce when the platform is flat relative to the ground. When you go through the corner, it tends to roll more. So say you had a circuit that was all high-speed right-hand corners, you would obviously set it up to have some tilt in the car, but it's a compromise throughout all the circuits. So sometimes you might try this um, because there is an arrow gain to be had but overall sometimes you tend to lose out more in the other side than you gain 
uh, in the road side. The next parameter F1 teams play with is camber, where you tilt the top of the tires towards the center of the car. And well, that's negative camber the type we like when it comes to race cars. Positive camber is the other way around. And the reason for this with the front tires is that we're not really optimizing for grip when the car is running in a straight line. We're trying to get the most grip when we're cornering. And when you're cornering, you get roll. Because the center of gravity is above the contact patch, the car rolls over. In the case of a Formula One car, this isn't actually all that much, but it's still there. When this happens, you get dynamic camber change, where the outside tires will reduce in camber. So negative camber is there to maximize the tires contact patch with the track during cornering, when the grip is the most important, spreading the load over the largest area of tire possible. Remember, the tire is experiencing incredible load here, and that load deforms the tire. So spreading the load over more tire increases grip and reduces tire wear. And there is another effect as well, something called camber thrust, where you get a force acting towards the apex of a corner, purely down to the camber. It's actually similar to how a MotoGP rider creates a turning effect purely by leaning the bike over. And the more camber, the more camber thrust. And while this isn't a whole lot of extra grip, it is a bonus. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that this is different with the rear tires, because with the rear tires, we care more about traction, accelerating at the corner. And the more camber we have, the less contact patch we have, which can actually hinder the car through acceleration. However, if you go too far with camber, the tires contact patch is much smaller in a straight line. So then, braking can be compromised. You will tend to run quite a bit of camber on the front and quite a bit on the rear. Why you wouldn't want to run you know, an insane level of camper. One, if you're doing anything more than a single lap, you have tire wear. So high camper will tend to generate more tire wear. High camper might have poor braking performance. The other thing, which is a consideration, is if you're doing long stints, high camper might generate loads of stress on the shoulders of the tire, which are structurally unsound. And that's something in Formula One, Pirelli have end of straight camber limits. So in Brazil, the front camber limit was three and a quarter, and the rear camber limit was two. And these are there in place so that the teams do not operate the tires and windows in terms of stresses and loads that are not foreseen. Um, and it's a safety mechanism just to say, we're sure the tires will work in this camber window, keep it here and the loads and stresses will be fine. So camber adjustments on the car are typically straightforward. Most cars will be uh, inside of the brake ducts. You'll take off a panel and there'll be a set of shims that you take in and out. And it's one of those things you know that you know, the thin shim is, you know, a tenth of a degree. The bigger shim is a quarter of a degree. And those are very quick in session changes. Next is caster. And this is a bit of a weird one because you don't tend to change it all that much. Caster is the difference between your steering axes and the vertical axes. The more you have, the heavier the steering wheel will be and the more cross weight change you'll have in the car. You might have experienced this before if you've been karting. When you're stationary, you'll actually feel it the most. When you turn the steering wheel, the whole car jacks up one way. And in karting, this is actually used to lift up the inside rear tire to stop it dragging through a corner because of course they don't have differentials. Now, you don't actually feel caster too much in the car other than through the steering wheel, but it's useful as it creates a self-centering effect, making the car more stable at high speed. Caster is one of those things on your setup that you don't tend to change too often. Across 10 F1 cars, I have never seen an adjustable caster option because it's typically brackets in places where you don't want to put them and upright weight is important. Most teams will tend to pick one caster geometry and stick with it for an entire season. Next is toe. And this is the one that you can really feel as a driver. Toe is the difference between the direction the car is traveling and the direction the tire is set to. So on the front of the car, we tend to run toe out. And this gives you a little bit more bite when you turn into a corner. Then on the rear, we actually run toe in. And this can help the rear of the car turn more through the corner. I've driven a few F1 cars that were running a fair bit of toe on the rear. When you go on the throttle, you can really feel it turn the car and it fires you out of the corner. That then can give you the confidence to get on the throttle earlier and get a better exit onto the straight. And with toe, the more that you run, the more scrubbing you get on the tires because the tires are pointing in subtly different directions. They fight each other and they actually create drag. But you can also use this to create tire temperature. Just remember the DAS system by Mercedes. So how 
how much tow would you run on a Formula 1 car? Well, I found this setup sheet from Kimi Raikkonen's car in 2012. I think the photographer was using a long lens and got it from a monitor in Kimi's garage. But look just here. That's minus one on the front, so tow out, and plus two on the rear. Now, it's worth noting that that isn't in degrees, it's actually in millimeters, so tiny fractions of a degree. So you'll typically run a little bit of tow out on the front, which is stable, and you'll run a little bit of tow in on the rear, which is stable. An interesting anecdote to that is looking back to Mercedes DAS system or dual axis steering system. What that did was effectively change the static tow and probably not for this video, but for context, I, one of the things I think the DAS was for was for tire warm up. So, you know, being able to run a little bit more tow in will tend to generate more scrubbing temperature in a straight line. For setting up a car, tow is most often concerned uh, with turn in entry stability. Now, what about spring rates? You can imagine that F1 cars would try and run as stiff as possible to keep the aero platform as stable as they can or to reduce roll in the corners. But it's not that simple. If you took that super stiff car to Monaco, you would smash the car into the ground and you'd be likely to break things. Or you could be going through a fast corner, hit a bump and suddenly have very little grip. Definitely not ideal. So then you would need to lift the car up, increase the ride height and soften off the suspension. That would give you more roll and pitch change in the car, or so you might think. F1 cars actually have another set of springs to manage this. They of course have a spring for each wheel, but they also have springs for heave, or the up and down motion in the car. So you can actually control these different aspects separately. Then there's another factor. Soft cars tend to create more grip. The suspension can better conform to the curvatures or undulations. Then remember that these cars also load up with tons of downforce at high speed. So through a tight hairpin, you might want the car riding higher to take the curves a bit better, then through the fast corners, the car sits down and creates the peak downforce that you want. So what kind of setup have F1 teams actually landed on? So spring rates are something that you tend to have a roughly good idea of what you're going to run on the car before you get to a weekend. You've done your aero simulations, so you know, the ride heights you want to be in, you know, the stiffnesses you want to be in. You probably have a good idea of if the track is smooth or bumpy. Um, on a smooth track, you might be able to get away with running a stiffer car. On a bumpy track, you might have to run quite soft. Uh, think of Monaco, high ride heights, soft setup. So after you've done your simulations, you've probably done a driver in the loop simulator and you have a good idea of how that car feels. Changing springs on the track is as simple as removing a cap, pulling out a spring, uh, usually a torsion bar and replacing that. Like we said before, changing springs and ride heights and cambers is stuff that you want to be able to make super quick changes. You may not make huge setup changes, but you will be able to change those quickly. But there's one more thing that comes into this, the tires. And there's one thing that a lot of people might not appreciate is the 18 inch tires are the same vertical stiffness as the old 13 inch tires with the big balloon sidewalls. So that means you are still running the front suspension relatively stiff and you could be running the front suspension on a bump rubber or a packer and relying on the suspension travel to come from the tires alone. So we have the spring rates to manage how stiff the car is, but we do have another tool for the lateral stiffness in the car, how much the car rolls through a corner. And this is the anti-roll bar. And on a Formula One car, this is a tiny torsion bar. This links the left and right sides of the car on each axle, and this resists the rolling motion of the car. So when the outside tire is loaded, it actually drops the other side to match, reducing the roll. And as a driver, you feel this a lot. A softer bar gives us more complexity compliance and therefore grip, but go too soft and the car can be difficult to balance on the limit. Whereas the stiffer bar can give us more control, but often offers up less grip. The overall roll stiffness of the car will be set depending on A, the bumpiness of the circuit, the, the nature of the circuit is at high speed or low speed. If it's a high speed circuit, you may want a slightly stiffer car. And then you've got the anti-roll bars front and rear, which make up a lot of the roll stiffness. And you will tune these to achieve a, a given car balance. More front bar, more understeer, less front bar, more oversteer, and vice versa on the rear axle. Now, the main thing to know out of all of this is that the whole thing is a balance. If you change one thing, it often compromises the other. And so there's often a load of ways a setup could work. And F1 engineers try and find the best overall solution surrounding car setup is you're always trying to make the car the least slow so there's lots of other considerations and it's making the driver as most comfortable as possible in the car a 
and making sure that you're not operating outside of the window on anything because you're trying to chase this, you know, really high bit of performance or this peak somewhere that you end up spending time outside of the window elsewhere. Blake explained this in more detail in his video all about anti-dive, which you can watch just here. Or check out this video where I show you the actual components of F1 suspension and how they work. If you're a student aiming to work in motorsport or already do, I'm looking for some help. If you've enjoyed any of my videos, please take a look in the description and give me two minutes of your time. Be sure to check out Blake's channel here and I'll catch you in the next one.